Please know I am but a humble Ravenpuff and do not own or take credit for any of the magical fanfictions on this podcasting channel. Nor do I own any rights or magical say on J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter characters that are mentioned within these stories. These fanfictions are the result of much more creative and dedicated minds than my own, and I will be introducing these authors as well as where to find their other works at the beginning of every episode. Hello, my magical brethren, and welcome to Fox's Fix, a podcast that attempts the sonorous charm on some of your favorite Harry Potter fan fictions. So whether you're taking the night bus across town, denoming your garden, or simply shopping through Diagon Alley, this is a podcast that allows even the busiest witches and wizards a chance to listen to their favorite fan fiction. So I'd say it's time we take a page out of Fox's book and light up this week's fan fiction. Fox's Fix presents the unabridged audiobook of Isolation, written by Bex Chan and narrated by Fox's Fix. Bex Chan's novel-length fanfiction can be located on fanfiction.net as well as archiveofourown.org. Warning, this fanfiction is rated mature for its explicit language, content, and themes. Chapter 3. Doors Hermione woke too quickly. Her eyes snapped open and went wide, darting nervously around her room. She sucked in a short gasp and covered her face with her palms, blinking away her sleep and gulping back her dry throat. She felt disoriented and muddled, like an imp had skipped through the cabins of her mind and fiddled with her thoughts. She rubbed away the cold sweat on her forehead and sat up, looking around her room and ensuring that everything was where it should be. Her nightmares had been so vivid recently. She couldn't for the life of her decide if last night had been a trick of her subconscious or if everything had actually been real. Perhaps there was no Snape, no Malfoy, no secret. Maybe she was still the sole inhabitant of her dorm. Maybe. Her tired gaze fell to the rope burns on her arms and she exhaled a disappointed sigh. She wanted so bad for it to be a dream, so willing to delude herself. Call it the brain's defense mechanisms, or call it hope. Hell, call it whatever you wanted. The fact of the matter was, it hadn't been a nightmare. It made Hermione feel sick. She could actually feel the contents of her stomach churn, and she contemplated just how close he was. Just her small bathroom between them, just two walls. She glanced at her clock and wanted to scream when she realized she only managed three hours of sleep. Hermione honestly thought that she would have managed to gain at least a little bit more rest considering how exhausted she'd been. But no, evidently her insomnia was here to stay. Oh joy. It was pushing nine in the already miserable morning and she could already hear the usual raindrops tapping against her window. She knew that it was futile to try and get any more sleep, so she slowly eased herself out of bed, grabbing her bathrobe and her wand, and headed for the shower. Keeping as quiet as she could, she peered out of the bedroom wearily, catching sight of Malfoy's discarded and scuffed shoes. The remains of her optimism fluttered away with that final and damning observation and she quickly slipped into the bathroom. Shrugging off yesterday's clothes, Hermione muttered a quick spell to flick on the shower at high heat. The witch turned to look herself in the mirror, brushing her knotted curls away from her face and fingering the shadowy crescents under her eyes. There was just too much torture on her face, and it tucked into the creases of her permanent frown. She looked like a tracing paper version of herself, paler and almost translucent, like frosted glass. Hermione focused on her eyes instead and thanked Merlin when she saw the familiar glint in them, the spark of fire and determination that had always lingered, that had yet to be beaten. She was going to be fine. She was just tired and wondering exactly how she was supposed to coexist with Malfoy. When the mirror finally started to steam, she turned away from her worrying reflection and released a content moan as the steamy water soothed her shape. She closed her eyes and massaged the soap into her skin, 
inhaling the vanilla scent with a calming breath. She lathered her arms first, then her shapely chest and flat stomach, then bent down to stroke the length of her legs. This felt good. This felt like normality, and she basked in the sensations. She could feel her muscles easing, and it was wonderful. Relaxing enough that she allowed her ever-crowded mind to cease thinking, if only to shield the memories of last night. If only to forget that someone she despised was sharing her dorm. A Death Eater. It took a bit more soap, but she let it all go and allowed herself to escape because she knew it would only get harder from here. Merlin, forgive her for pretending it didn't all exist for just some stolen minutes. Draco lifted one heavy lid when a female moan seeped into his room. The whispers of running water had started to stir him a few minutes ago, but it was the strange sighs and mews that woke him completely. His brow furrowed when he didn't recognize his surroundings, and he raised his head to eye the room suspiciously. He remembered then. He remembered he was in Hogwarts. Remembered he was sharing a dorm with the mudblood. Shit. He gnashed his teeth and his eyes went to the window. Draco knew it wouldn't work, but he tried anyway flinging himself off the bed and trying to shove it open. And of course, the clasp wouldn't budge. So he drew back his fist and smashed it into the glass as hard as he could. But it didn't even crack. He growled as a small trickle of blood slithered across his knuckles. It hurt, but he had had so much worse. Yes, definitely trapped. And this was definitely his new prison. Another female purr leaked into the air, and he instinctively reached for his wand to silence the irritating sounds. But he didn't have his wand, did he? No, didn't have a bloody thing, not even a set of clean clothes to put on. Oh, for fuck's sake, he muttered, heading back to the bed. He hadn't had enough rest. His movements were sluggish, and his sight was blurry. He had five months of sleep to catch up on, after all. It would have been so easy easy if Granger's incessant shower noises weren't polluting his atmosphere. He snatched the pillow and covered his ears, but it only muffled her. Ugh. He had a sinking and scratching feeling that she did this every morning. Hermione's imagination only managed to distract her for 15 minutes or so before reality clawed its way back in. With a dejected breath, she stopped the water and left the shower, returning to the mirror and palming away the condensation. She gave this new reflection a ghost of a smile, deciding it was notably better. The warm water had roused a healthy blush to her skin, and she felt more human, more present. She wrapped the fluffy and practical bathrobe around her and spared her damp and blurry reflection one last look before she grabbed her wand off the sink to mutter a quick drying charm on her hair. Her fist had just closed around the knob to her bedroom when she heard a small knock at the main door. She cringed slightly, but sorted her wits and crossed her sitting room to answer it, and a genuine smile graced her features when she eyed her visitor. Hello, Dobby. She grinned, noting the large trunk behind him. Morning, miss, he nodded meekly, ever the nervous little soul. Had mistress said for Dobby to bring this? Thank you, Dobby, Hermione said, knowing they were probably things for Malfoy. Could you do me a favor, Dobby? Yes, miss, the house elf chirped merrily. What does miss want Dobby to do? Could you possibly sort out some extra food for me? She requested. And could I possibly come collect it later? Dobby can bring it here. Oh, no, that's okay, Hermione told him with a delicate wave of her hand. I'm going for a little walk later, so I'll pick it up. Honestly, it's fine. Yes, miss, he mumbled, obviously a little disappointed. I go now. Must help clean after breakfast. She wanted to tell him to stay, 
feeling substantially safer with someone she knew around, but then he was gone with a snap of his fingers. She did some quick calculations in her head and realized that she hadn't seen any of her friends for about five days. Having spent all her free time in the library, doing what she could to assist the order. She glanced behind her at Malfoy's door and concluded that she would need to meet with them soon. They were another dose of something normal, another escape. Hermione pulled her robe a little tighter around herself as a chilly breeze swept up the corridor and invaded her dorm. She jerked her wand to levitate the chest into her sitting room and let it crash to the floor with a loud thunk right outside Malfoy's room. She considered giving him a shout to explain that he now had some belongings, but reasoned with her common sense that the Hogwarts motto was there for a reason. It really was best to let sleeping dragons lie, especially a prejudiced, psychotic dragon who was caged against his will. She jumped when the autumn breeze shoved her door closed with a piercing clap, and then she could hear movement coming from his room accompanied by a heated and masculine muttering that sounded like venom. Even if it was just muffled nonsense behind that door, she considered running for her room to avoid the hassle. But the stubborn lioness within her wouldn't allow it. She squared her shoulders defiantly and narrowed her eyes, preparing for the inevitable theatrics. His door was flung open with an agitated tug, hard enough that it bashed into the wall behind it but she beat her instincts to flinch. The frustrated Slytherin came into her sight, his tall body filling the doorframe, and he was clumsily clad in his trousers and an unfastened black shirt, but she didn't notice that. She refused to let her eyes wander lower than his bottom lashes, knowing that eye contact was power. It was control. You are doing my head in. He roared, his upper lip curling against his cheekbones with high irritation. Could you make any more sodding noise? You little... You want me to make more noise? Hermione replied innocently, cocking her head to one side. With a swish of her wand, all the doors in her dorm opened and then slammed closed again, and she refused her instinct to blink at the heavy bangs. Better for you, Malfoy? Very mature of you, Granger. He sneered, and she could feel the intensity of his stare from across the room. You think you're so fucking clever. I think we can both agree that I am fucking clever. She cut in, a little uncomfortable with her swear word, but she covered it well. As you so eloquently put it, Stop making so much noise, he growled, his voice a foreboding rumble that lingered between them. Stop banging things. Stop talking. Stop moving. I can do whatever the hell I want in my room, Malfoy, Hermione argued, faltering when he sidestepped the trunk and stalked towards her. She backed up against the wall and raised her wand, but he didn't cease his long strides. Don't come near me. As if I would fucking touch you, he growled, stopping only when the end of her wand prodded against his chest. I would sooner die. Be my guest, she retorted quickly. It would be worth it. I'm warning you, Granger, he sneered. I refuse to put up with this. It's like having a dysfraxic giant in the room. Deal with it, Hermione snapped, adding more pressure to his chest with her wand, although she would swear it only pushed her further against the wall. She quickly tugged her robe a little tighter around herself, but if Malfoy noticed her post-shower attire, He gave no indication whatsoever. Thank Merlin. I mean it, Granger, he scowled. Stop making so much noise or put a silencing spell on my room. As if I would waste my magic to accommodate you. Then shut the fuck up, he yelled, slamming his fist into the wall beside her head. The castle's magic ensured there would be minimal damage, just a small dent but the vibrations of the hit skimmed across the shell of her ear and roused a reluctant shiver. I need rest, and I can't get any of it if you won't shut your mudblood mouth. She drew her free hand back with the intention of hammering it into his creamy face. But maybe she was growing a little too predictable. Her angry eyes shifted to the long fingers tight around her wrist. 
and she felt her blood bubble like sun-stimulated acid. Let go of me. Nope, you've reached your punch quota for now, he told her. You're going to have to wait another four years. Let go of my arm, Hermione advised, biting out each syllable. Or I swear, I will... You'll what? Malfoy challenged, tightening his hold against her wrist and thrusting her hand against the wall right next to the dent his fist had left. Her next move was instinctive and quick, and her wand was to his throat, stabbing the space between his Adam's apple and a vein that spasmed with his rage. Her eyes locked onto his defiantly, daring him to goad her further. Hermione didn't doubt for a second that she would hex him to Hogsmeade him back if he continued to tease her fragile temper. But his iron gray eyes barely flicked, and the grip on her wrist remained firm. Go ahead, Granger, Malfoy responded. It was his confidence that rattled her the most and stirred her magic to pour out of her wand and scorch his skin. You fucking bitch, Malfoy shouted, stumbling back and clutching the fresh burn on his neck. You'll pay for that. I've had enough of you, Hermione told him, her wand still trained on the blonde. Go back to your room and get some sleep. Don't you even try and boss me around, you filthy little... I'm going out, Hermione interrupted steadily, even if her anger was begging to skip into her words. So you will have a few hours of undisturbed sleep. I suggest you make the most of them. Then piss off already. Malfoy grumbled, turning his back to her and heading into his room. His door slammed and she allowed herself to grimace this time. She needed to get out of this dorm. The living room was now tainted with new and uninvited scents, and she felt like a hunted badger being smoked out of her set. She tore her gaze away from his door and rushed into her bedroom, changing as quick as she physically could. Fully dressed in her jeans and a comfortable jumper to fight the cold, she swiftly left her head girl dorm and started for the library. The walk was so much longer than she remembered, and the students that were littered sparsely in the corridors were watching her. She would swear it, but they couldn't know about her vile house guest. Could they? Their lingering stare said otherwise, and she quickened her paranoid steps, until she was racing with burning thighs and clapping footfalls. And then she smacked straight into a tall wall of flesh, but at least it was polite enough to catch her before she fell. Neville, she gasped, regaining her balance on his outstretched arms. Oh, thank God. Hermione, Neville breathed with evident concern. Are you all right? I'm fine, she rushed, tucking a stray curl away with her trembling fingers. I'm sorry, I wasn't looking where I was going. You're really pale, Hermione, Neville commented. Are you ill or something? No, no, not ill, Hermione shook her head, offering him a false smile. I just haven't had breakfast yet. We haven't seen you in ages, he told her, and she realized then just how much he matured. Ginny and Luna were saying they missed you yesterday, and, I know, I know, I've been rubbish recently, Hermione sighed, her eyes downcast. I'm sorry, Neville. I've just been trying to help Harry and Ron, and, Hermione, you need a break, Neville told her. It's not good for you, and you really do look ill. Will you come and meet us for dinner later? She was honestly too tired to protest. All right, she mumbled, earning a pleased smile from her friend. I'll meet you in the Great Hall later. She then slipped past Neville without waiting for a response and continued her urgent pursuit for the library, shuddering when a hungry growl of thunder shimmied along the corridors. But it was okay. She could see her target now. She threw herself against the library doors and savored a deep breath to still her jittery chest. Her cider-tinted gaze flickered around the empty chairs and abandoned desks, instinctively knowing that the vast space was only hers yet again. Even Madame Pince had spent less and less time amongst her precious books and tombs, instead passing most of her time with the other professors. I guess company could do that for some people. 
distract them from fear and grief. She supposed that most people probably found it more appropriate to enjoy the company of loved ones instead, or preparing for exams that might never come to pass. Perhaps even she would have snubbed her favorite hobby if she could actually see any of her loved ones. But she couldn't. Hermione went straight to her usual table, right at the back of the restricted section. Her desk was tucked away amongst the seldom-used bookshelves, with the perfect amount of seclusion for her to toss aside her troubling notions and swim away with the paragraphs. This was her sanctuary. Lost with the seductive ink-kissed pages, she could forget almost anything. She assioed her most recent text on horcruxes and started to read, praying that Malfoy's sneering features would be erased from her mind, at least just for a little while. Draco dragged the trunk into his room and quickly examined the contents with a critical eye. Well, it could have been substantially worse. While the clothes consisted of items he would have never picked himself, at least there were no horrid hints of red and gold amongst the fabrics. There were a few pairs of black trousers, some white and black shirts, and then three or four polo jumpers in black and gray too. At the bottom of the chest were some simple vests, a set of standard wizarding robes, accompanied with some black shoes, socks, and some extra underwear. It was more than he expected, but less than he hoped for. With a bitter grunt, he started to organize the clothes in the provided wardrobe the muggle way. Merlin, he missed his wand. McGonagall may as well have ripped off one of his limbs, the sodding cow. His wand had managed to keep him occupied when he had been confined to the shed with Snape. Whether he simply stretched the extent of his conjuring and transfiguration skills or practiced new spells, his wand had always encouraged time to go by that much quicker. And now that scraggly old hag had confiscated the only thing he could use to divert himself from the hollow hours of nothingness. He changed his clothes and simply sat on his bed for Merlin knows how long trying to think of something to do. He was no idiot. He knew that his inactivity and the imprisonment would do damaging things to his mind. His sleeping pattern alone was already buggered, and it was only a matter of time before his mind would start to close in on itself. He'd read the countless stories of foolish wizards who had locked themselves in closets and eventually gone insane after staring at the same four walls and having nothing to do. He needed a deterrent, Something to concentrate on and provide him with a goal, no matter how insignificant it seemed. Draco headed into the main area of the dorm and steered himself towards a small kitchenette, pointlessly plucking open the cabinets. The cabinets were full of the expected food products, but he had no idea how to prepare them without his magic. He settled on two green apples and slowly scanned his surroundings. His stormy gray eyes settled on a set of shelves practically buckling under the weight of various books. He stared at them for a long moment, rationalizing that reading would be an ideal way to keep him engaged. But no, those were the mudbloods. He didn't want to touch her things if he could help it. Draco continued to study the room as he gnawed away at the ripe fruit, and absently, he started counting. Hermione didn't meet her friends for lunch. It was a conscious decision, and one that she regretted a few hours later, but she'd honestly thought she had found something interesting. However, she'd forgotten that the French and Latin translations for the word crux were two entirely different things. She ended up making a quick trip to the kitchens to collect the extra food she'd requested from Dobby, but otherwise didn't leave the library. When the day had finally started to simmer into the evening, she'd barely noticed. Time was an irrelevant mess amongst the creaking bookcases. But when night blanketed the sky and her Lumos charm started to waver alongside her concentration, she decided it was best she returned to her dorm. A sad glance at her watch informed her that it was midnight, 
and it had been yet another disappointing day without any progress. She blamed the echoes of her argument with Malfoy for her inability to engage completely with her task, but accepted that her insomnia probably didn't help. Trudging her aching limbs back to her room, she allowed herself a relieved sigh when she found her dorm bathed in darkness, with no sign of the Slytherin bastard who should have been suffocating in an Azkaban cell. Mumbling a spell to illuminate the room, she set about putting the food in the appropriate cupboards and made herself a clumsy cup of tea. And then she could feel eyes on her, rubbing angry splinters into the back of her head. With a startling gasp, Hermione spun around and knocked over her hot drink to find Malfoy loitering in his doorframe again, observing her with fresh irritation. He watched her closely, like a territorial wolf who missed two meals. Draco had been waiting for her to return after the inevitable boredom had ignited the idea to pick a fight with her the moment she walked through the door. A little jumpy there, Granger, he remarked quietly, crossing his arms. Do I make you uncomfortable? You make me sick, Hermione told him squarely, her words crisp with honesty. Believe me when I say the feeling is mutual, Malfoy snarled. You're making noise again. Shut up and go to bed. Well, then put some silencing spells on my room, he countered. No, Hermione yelled, her chest inflating as she drew in a seething breath. I made it very clear that I would not waste my magic on you. Yes, you will, Malfoy responded calmly, taking a few strides and effectively circling her. I shouldn't have to listen to you. Well, tough luck, she snapped, slamming her palms against the counter between them. This is my room. I shouldn't have to listen to you or even look at you. Tough luck, Draco echoed, a crease slicing across his forehead with his impatience. Take it up with the old bitch and do us both a favor. Shut up, Hermione shouted, scrunching her eyes closed and quaking with anger now. Just stay out of my way, Malfoy. And how the fuck am I supposed to do that? Malfoy fired back. In case you haven't noticed... I can't leave your shitty little dorm, and it's hardly the most spacious room. Her glare flicked with the glaze of oncoming tears, but she fought them away before he would notice. Then just stay in your room. No, Malfoy interrupted arrogantly, placing his own hands on the counter and bringing his face level with hers. No, I find watching you squirm far too amusing, mudblood. Do you honestly think that silly little word bothers me anymore? She questioned with lowered eyes. Do you really believe I care what you think? I think you care a lot about how people perceive you. You are not people, she barked, smacking her palms down to the surface again. You are just, you're just... Go on, Granger, he encouraged, his voice deceptively inviting. How exactly do you feel about me? I'm curious. She paused and panted out a couple of hot breaths as her glare rolled over his sharp and expectant face. His pebble gray eyes were as hard as quartz, cold and illegible. They didn't waver. They waited for her answer. He wanted to know? Fine. It had been writhing under her skin for longer than he could possibly comprehend, and she could stand it no longer. You are the most spoiled and selfish person I have ever known. Hermione told him quietly, enunciating each tangy syllable. You have done nothing with your entire life but bully people, and you wouldn't know a real friend if they slapped you across the face, because you're too busy looking down at everyone to give a shit. Draco snorted, I'll have you know, I am not finished, Hermione spat, aiming her wand at him for a good measure. For years, you have just managed to avoid becoming exactly like your father. Evil, you will not talk about my father, Draco shouted, too enraged to consider the wand pointed at his chest. You have no fucking right. You wanted my opinion, she retorted. I always knew you were a vile little bastard, but I never thought you would become so twisted that you would become a Death Eater. Harry knew. He tried to tell us, but no. For some stupid reason, I thought you had some small dose of decency left in you. But I was so wrong. 
first time for everything, he muttered. And you turned into exactly what everyone expected. She ignored him, pulling away and pacing a few angry steps to the side. A follower to Voldemort and a pathetic excuse for a human because you couldn't even do that right. He growled. There it was, being shoved in his face again, his failure. Are you quite done? He responded. She sent him a fierce scowl, and he noted it was so much more intense than any look she'd ever dared to flash him before. Good. Getting her all riled up was bloody hilarious. You are sick and spiteful, she hissed, feeling her magic crackle between them as she tried to steady her sparking emotions. And you always will be, and I find that very sad. You want to know what I feel about you? Pity that you could allow yourself to become what you are. Another guttural rumble quivered at the back of his throat. Predictable as ever, Granger, he slurred. Always convinced there's good in everyone. Not everyone, she hushed him, and she almost sounded forlorn. Not you. Not anymore. Well, at least you're learning not to set yourself up for disappointment, he shrugged his bored shoulders, cocking an eyebrow when she took more steps away from him. Where are you going? Bed, she muttered, sparing him another golden spice glare. I am done with this conversation. Hold on now, he protested, marching to block her exit. It's my turn. I thought I made it very clear, she mumbled past tense lips, that I didn't care about your opinion of me. I didn't care about your opinion of me, he said slowly, straightening his back to loom over her. But you asked, she responded. Because I thought it would be amusing, he revealed, indulging a cruel smirk. And I was right. I know how you feel about me, she argued, trying her hardest to act nonchalant. Mudblood this, bookworm that. You're rather very predictable yourself, Malfoy. Well, I may surprise you. Merlin cursed her curiosity for shrouding her common sense for the upteenth time. Fine, she grumbled, eyeing him warily and tightening the fingers coiled around her wand. How do you feel about me then, Malfoy? You repulse me, he sneered with sudden hostility. The fact that we have to breathe the same air makes me want to vomit. You're disgusting. A rancid smear across the wizarding world. You don't deserve your magic. Repetitive nonsense, she forced her eyes to roll. I'm going to bed. Move or I'll make you. Oh, I'm just building up, he promised darkly. And something untamed and severe flared behind his stony eyes. She shifted her feet but refused to look away, needing to keep eye contact, control. I don't... You know you don't deserve your magic, he interrupted, baring his ivory teeth in an accusing snarl. And that's why you work so hard, isn't it? That's why you spend all your pathetic time studying. I happen to like reading, but you feel the need to prove yourself. Draco silenced her with a confident and condescending tone, because you know your magic isn't rightfully yours. Uncertainty mingled with honey, and he relished his victorious grin, because you know you're inferior. Her lip twitched, his smirk stretched, and that's why it kills you when I call you mudblood he finished, his delicious smugness bobbing his head with a proud nod. He could see that Gryffindor tendency fighting to control her tongue, so he stepped aside and headed for his bedroom door, satisfied that she was suitably rattled. Well, at least the revolting muggle spawn had successfully managed to provide some sort of entertainment to his dull as dust day. His fingers had just grazed the brass of the door handle, when there was a hot push against his spine, propelling him forward. He smacked headfirst into the adjacent wall and released a grunt of discomfort as he slid down the cold surface. The impact was still buzzing across his skin, but he knew pain would soon replace it within a heartbeat or a hum of a breath. He raised his head with every intention of charging Granger and smacking her against the wall but he barely caught her blurred shape as it ghosted into her room before the shrill bite of her blunt door deafened him for a moment. The pain subsided after a few seconds, just a little bump to his head and an ache in his back. 
He quickly gathered himself to his feet, and his eyes did a slow scan of the room, his dilated pupils focusing on the bookshelves again. Ah, yes, his previous distraction before the mudblood had returned. He had always been good with numbers and had decided that counting would be the thing to keep him sane. Granger had 101 books in her sitting room, 56, which were black, 40 red, 3 blue, and 2 green. Across all the spines were a total of 460 words, excluding the author's names. He had to double-check this and sorted the information away in his head. Draco's stare recommenced roaming around the room, searching for his next counting project for tomorrow, his next sanity-preserving task. But his eyes automatically fell to Granger's door, and he felt his rage bristle along the fine hairs coating his body and sink into his pores. Entertaining or not, the girl made his temper churn, and with a deep sigh, he decided he would find something else to count tomorrow. Hermione slumped against her door and hastily murmured a silencing charm before she released a gargled sob. Dear Merlin, she hated him. Hated him! She roughly smudged away her treacherous tears and stumbled on shaky legs as she made her way to her bed. She was denied a blink of sleep all night, and the witch's anger at the slimy Slytherin nagged her until the birds came with the navy morning. She despised those damn birds. And that was just day one. This has been an unabridged audio chapter of Isolation, written by Bex Chan and narrated by Fox's Fix. A special thank you goes out to Bex Chan for allowing me the privilege to read her story. To recommend your favorite Harry Potter fanfiction for future audiobook episodes, please visit Fox Fix Facebook page and Instagram through the links located in our description below. You can also help support us with donations through our PayPal account to help produce and shape in our future narrated fanfictions. Thank you for listening. Please join us next week for a continuation of this magical fanfiction. See you then!